February 11th, 2016. I'm trying to see where the camera is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Shakespeare's Hamlet. This is Act 2, Scene 2, line about 434. And this is Hamlet speaking to the young actors who are going to be take part in the play within a play of Hamlet. And this is Hamlet speaking to these players, but he's also going to, and this would have been Shakespeare's pleasure, is he's going to have a, a, a very kind of archaic poem in the center of it, which is almost a play within a play within a play. And the poem or the tale is somewhat Greek mythology, but it's Pyrrhus who is the son of Achilles is revenging his father's murder. It's very like, very much like the situation that Hamlet's in. And then we have Priam, who is part of the fall of Troy. Hecuba is Priam's wife. So we have Hamlet speaking to the players. I heard the speak me a speech once, but it was never acted. Or if it was, not above once. For the play I remember, please not the million, t'was caviar to the general. But it was as I received it, and others among whose judgments cried in the top of mine, an excellent play. Well digested the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savory, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affectation, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more fine than handsome. One speech in it I chiefly loved was Aeneas's tale to Dido. And thereabouts of it, especially when he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, Begin at this line. Let me see, let me see. The rugged Pyrrhus, like the Hyrcanian beast, is not so, it begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal, Head to foot, now is he total gules, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets that lend a tyrannous and damned light to the Lord's murder, roasted in wrath and fire, and thus oversized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus, old grandsire, Priam seeks. So proceed you. For God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Anon he finds him, striking too short at Greeks. His ancient sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus, the Priam drives, in rage, strikes wide. But with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to fill this blow, with flaming top, stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner, Pyrrhus's ear, for lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick, so as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter did nothing. But as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below, as hush as death, anon the dreaded thunder doth rend the region. So after Pyrrhus's pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work. 
And never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars' armor, forged for proof he turned with less remorse. And Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune, all you gods in synod, take away her power, break the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiends. This is too long. <laughs> but it actually goes on. But we'll put a, a bookmark right there. It's always good to recite ancient bits, for it keeps the synapses crackling, snapping, hopping. <laughs>